uh, through emergency reporting. And we're just a couple minutes short of our start time, so we'll be getting started in about two minutes. Okay, everyone, we're going to get started here. My name is Adrian with Emergency Reporting, and my current role is a Chief Operations Officer in Emergency Reporting, and I'm also a firefighter with uh, two fire departments up here in Washington State, the Cedar Woolley Fire and the Skagit Fire District 5, uh, up near Bellingham, Washington. And for those of you that aren't aware, um, Bellingham, Washington is where our office is based, and that's up in Washington State on the west side, uh, way up north next to the Canadian border. So uh, right now it's uh, kind of overcast and cloudy, so typical Washington weather. And so today we're going to talk about uh, INFERS. Uh, but first, before we do that, we have a bunch of really good training opportunities I want to mention. We have regional training conferences. We do these a couple times a year in different parts of the country. We also do uh, on-site training. We'll fly on-site to your location. And we do online training. Uh, we do these virtual Thursdays every every Thursday, but we also can do, uh, one of our trainers can perform a class or training for you online, uh, so you can get everyone together at your station and we can deliver the training there uh, remotely. So lots of training opportunities, Those there'll be ways, uh, there's more ways you can learn about that on our website, emergencyreporting.com. Uh, there'll also be a contact at the end of the training where you can email or, or call to get more information about the training options available. So with that, um, there's a, here's a little more detail. So emergency reporting experience. So this is a regional training conference. And we have three different components of it. There's the essentials on day one. It's a three-day training. Uh, essentials on day one. So this is how emergency reporting, um, the, the basic utilities of emergency reporting, how to create users, how to administer the system, and so on and so forth. Uh, integration is more detailed in depth, depending on uh, the, the needs of the room, what we're looking at doing. And then lead EER. And the lead ER is a, on day three where we have some options to talk through you know, how we prioritize new product development and ways that identify the, the key needs of your department and how we can help you fulfill those uh, outstanding needs. So that's the regional training conferences. We have two that are coming up to the now in the end of the year. There's Charlotte, North Carolina, November 3rd to the 5th. And then we have Monterey, California, 7th to the 9th. There's room available in both these trainings right now, these regional training conferences. There's, uh, there's also an early bird pricing that's available if you sign up soon. And there's more information on our website, uh, mercyreporting.com. You can see more information, background on it, as well as pricing information. And if you go to eventbrite.com and search, uh, you'll see Best City to, to actually sign up for the, the uh, regional training conferences. All right, so since the last time we did a virtual Thursday last week, just in that seven-day period, we've had 14 new customers come on board. Um, so thank you all, welcome. Thank you for coming to the emergency reporting. Uh, okay, so for today, uh, we're going to do a quick overview of AIMFERS reporting and how the AIMFERS reporting mechanism works inside emergency reporting. So we'll talk about how AIMFERS required fields are shown to the users, and there's a couple different Caveats to that, we'll walk through examples of how that's done, and so you know what to look for. And we have how logical errors are displayed. And so Inverse has a, a couple different ways required information is displayed, and sometimes it's on an individual field by field basis, and then sometimes there's these logical errors that, that are can be kind of confusing to you get your arms around, and we handle those, and so we'll walk through how to, how to do those, uh, how to set them up and how to resolve them. And then how to export. And so once you do your inference reporting, you need to send it to your state or upload the data to, to the National Fire Administration, FEMA, which is now part of Homeland Security, and talk, talk about that, specific to your state. Then export messages. This talks about how uh, this will give you specific guidance on how to export your data uh, appropriate to your state. And then last but not least is what do you do if an error is discovered? And we do a lot of data, um, and so we deal with this a lot. So we'll just walk through the, the steps on how to, how to correct those issues. Okay, so uh, I'm going to flip uh, to uh, the web browser right now. Um, but just for your information, this, this is if you're interested in learning more about training, there's a couple different options. You can email, <coughs> excuse me, you can email Nicole, training at emergencyreporting.com, and you can also contact us 
here, uh, here's the telephone numbers. And we'll, uh, excuse me, one second. There we go. There's our telephone numbers on our website. And then uh, Nicole's email address can be reached by going to trainingnumbersreporting.com. OK. So we're going to switch browsers now. And this is the main uh, web page. Excuse me, hold on one second. OK. So at this point, you should be having the, the main web page of emergency reporting. Um, your system might be slightly different depending on your access levels and what packages you, your department is signed up for. But this is a training account at emergency reporting. And uh, it's a test account, of course. And so uh, left-hand side, uh, incident module, where first we're going to go through how to um, uh, complete an infra's incident. And this assumes, although, you know, I'm going to briefly touch on this. Uh, we're going to go to personnel and apparatus just because I want to show you quickly. This assumes it's already been done. So this list is a list of all your personnel. Uh, it's in the administration module. And you need to set this up first. Okay? So all these people here are, are, are users in my, my training account here. And so we got to do that first. So this assumes you've already set up your users. If you haven't set up your users, you'll, you'll uh, you'll have kind of a short incident. So that's one thing. And then the other thing I want to show you is apparatus. And so we're going to go back to administration and talk about infers imports. I'll talk about that in just a second. And on apparatus list, it's right here. And you got to set up your apparatus before you can do an incident. So again, um, new users, you should go do that first. Uh, and we'll, we'll just click on that. The apparatus list is quite simple, just a list of apparatus. Each one contains information about the, uh, the apparatus. And then the required fields will be listed in red. And these required fields might be a little different depending on what your configuration is for your account, if you have EMS enabled or not. However, you need to complete these required fields prior to saving the apparatus. So this account, uh, we've already done that. And we have. We have all these apparatus already completed. So we have personnel, apparatus, and then the other thing we do here is for, this is not part of today's training, I just want to highlight it, is if you have old infers data from a prior application, you can upload that information into emergency reporting. And you do that by going to the administration and clicking infers import. And this is a, a five-step process where you can upload your data. And uploading your data will pre-fill your account with as much information as we can get out of the file. So your personnel list, if you have personnel in the interest file, will fill that out. If you have your apparatus list, we'll fill that out. If you have your ranks, we'll try to fill that out. All these different things we'll try to pull out of the inverse file. So if you're a new user just coming on board, upload your inverse data. Then do your personnel, do your apparatus, and then you'll be able to actually do what I'm going to demonstrate here in a few minutes. So um, with that, that's just a very quick overview of the administration module and completing apparatus, personnel, and infers imports. Assuming you've done that, we'll now move on to infers actually completing an incident and how to export the data. We will come back to this uh, administration module in just a few minutes to show how to pull data out of the system. So first, we're going to go home. And on the left-hand side, at the very top, if you have the correct uh, per permissions, you can click on Incidents. And here we have the main incident page. And the main incident page has a list of all the incidents uh, in your account. And I'm trying to see here. In this account, we have nothing but incomplete calls. Oh, that, hold on. Stand by. Let me change that. No, still all incomplete calls. And so, the incidents are listed here in the main incident page. And uh, there's three different types of statuses. Uh, what we have here is incomplete, which are represented as a, as a unlock red padlock. If the incident is complete, it'll show as a yellow padlock, which I'll demonstrate. And then if it's reviewed, it'll show as a re uh, green review padlock. I'll demonstrate that as well. And so we're going to go do a normal 
incident, assuming we do not have a CAD link. And so today, uh, this incident page you see right now just shows a bunch of incomplete incidents. You can get an incomplete incident from a CAD or from manually through the system. I'm going to do a manual call. Uh, the CAD is very similar. So on the upper left-hand corner, there's a button that says New. I'm going to click New. And here we go. We're starting our incident. And so the fields that are red are required for this incident. And you'll notice here on this account, I've got a different multiple FD IDs. If you have only one FD ID, you won't see a drop down. Then you have your state, in this case Washington, then we have our stations. So I'm going to go in here. Now, this assumes that my stations have already been set up in my administration module. So that's why this field, this is a user defined field. Now we have shift or platoon. This is also defined in the administration module. I'm going to say I'm an A shift. Now we're going to the date. We have our date. Now you can type in the date, or you can click the today link, and that dumps in today's date. I can type my incident number, or I can click next ID. I'll put in my incident number. And my dispatch run number. Uh, this account is configured to have a CAD link set up. This will be optional. Normally it would be black text, but this account has, pertains as a CAD link. So I'm just going to put in some phantom data so I can get my call started. I'm going to hit save. Oh, location type. So the system says you got to do a location type, for incident type. So here is a list box, and this gives me all the different infers incident types that are available on this account. You have a category at the top. So I'm going to say uh, rescue EMS, or so I'm going to click that, and there's 300 series. And I'm going to say 321. And I'm going to hit save, which just means I stay on the page. Now my incident has been created, and on the left-hand side, correction, on the top, there is a series of, we call this navigation, okay? And this navigation up here is dynamic based on the call. And that'll change uh, depending on the incident type. So if I change my incident type to a 111 and hit save, watch the navigation on the top, it'll change. Now we have new fields. We have fire, structure fire, and some other ones. My 321 is just an EMS call. Put that back. Okay, less, less number of icons. So just keep that in mind. The icons are dynamic based on the requirements of the system. And also, as the requirements change, the inverse requirements of the system change. And that's all wired in together. So the required fields are red on the page, are also going to be reflected as red light, green light in the navigation bar at the top. So what that means is, if I we go to next, and we go to basic two, there's three questions. I've answered them. Uh, notice up here in basic two, the second light is green. That's on the page of one. I want to say here, I want to record people, information about people involved. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to hit next. Now there's a new people involved icon at the top. So um, now we are basic three. Infers requires a number of fields are out here, so I'm going to put in street address. I'm going to go to our office here, 851 Coho Way. Here's the appropriate types. Go find Way. And you may have seen that uh, Coho Way is dropped down quickly. That is out of our master street address. You can set up uh, key street names. Like the correct spelling of your streets can be set up in administration, so it, it gives you that drop down. I'm not going to go over that today, but that's enough. That's what you saw there. Bellingham, Washington, 98225. Now I go down here. Now, this text here across your directions is black because it's optional, it's not required. And the only other required field is properties. So here in property, you're going to hit the list box, and we go to residential, say 419, one or two family dwelling. Now I'm going to hit save on this page, it'll flip to green, and now that page will go on. Okay, so hold on just a second. Cindy just came in and told me some people can't hear. Just a moment, I'm going to see if we can figure this out.
Okay, so we have a couple people have reported they can't hear me speak okay. We're, we can see it here, it's transmitting, and it's uh, all the way up on the volume on transmission. And could someone please verify that they can hear us okay? We're dropping us a, a question so we can see. We're trying to figure this out real quick before we move on. Seems echo. Okay. Okay, so some people say they can't hear. Some people say they can hear fine. Some people say it's echoed. Uh, I'm sorry about that, folks. I don't know why it's echoing. I know people report they can hear okay. I'm going to keep going because uh, we're transmitting. I can see we're transmitting. I can see we're recording. So I'm not sure what the problem is. Okay. Okay, so back to our presentation. So we've completed meaningful required fields. Um, the page, uh, I had saved on the page, it flips to green uh, on basic three. And so these are the inverse requirements. As we're completing these, and we're completing those, in, those requirements. As you input more information, the system will add additional pages. And those pages will have the appropriate inference requirements. So the whole thing's all wired together. You just complete the required fields, you put the information on the page, keep hitting next. The system will figure out all the requirements for you and put it up on the page. And you, your, your navigation bar at the top will gradually turn more green as you complete the incident. So I'm going to quickly just move along here and input uh, a quick call so we can see this. And then I'll show what that looks like. So I'm going to add an apparatus. I'm going to say uh, Battalion 2, the white lights and sirens, I, today. And I fill the dates all the way down. And I'm going to say we went out. I think this account is configured for uh, West Coast time, so we'll say 0800. And I'm just going to fill out my times here. And I arrived at uh, 0621. And I'm going to tap through times that don't apply. Clear the scene, 081645. And I was in quarters. 0822 and in service at 081645 and create the scene. And then these are the people that are on my list. Right? And I can filter down their names. Okay, there's my three person crew. There's my times. I hit next. I have a green light on battalion two. I have a green light on basic four. I can add more apparatus if needed. Uh, but it's all it's all here. So I'm going to hit next. Now, let's say I want to jump to the end of the call, and I want to be done with it. So I click the Authorize button, the padlock up here, to go to the end. The system will provide a series of questions, uh, errors back to you. And these errors are completely in sync with the, the red light, green light at the top of the page, and the red fields are required on the page. They're all together. So this tells you where you need to go back and make the correction. And if I go all the way back to basic one, and I change my incident type to 111 to a structure fire, I get lots more icons. And I go to the end page, I have a greater number of errors. So this, all of these infers errors and compliance are completely in sync together. You just got to keep trucking through the call, completing it. But for the interest of time, I'm going to change this back to a 321. And that's going to greatly shorten my, my list. I go back to my error list. There we go. I click on the first error. Takes me back to the appropriate spot so I can finish my report. So I say type of service requested. 911 response, complaint reported by dispatch. Um, we'll say breathing problem. 
action taken. If I know the action taken, I can type it in. Otherwise, I'm going to hit the list box. And we'll say provide BLS 32. The rest, I'm going to leave blank because it doesn't apply. Next. Oh, and I, earlier, I said I want to record people involved. So I click people involved. Now, people involved is optional, but I said I want to do it. So I'm going to say, I don't know, I'll say uh, uh, reporting party. And I'll say John Smith. Hit next. There we go. There are the people involved. And hit next. I go into my narrative. Just say EMS call all patient care per med one. Okay, just punt that narrative onto the med unit that arrived on scene before I did. Uh, okay, so there's my narrative. I, here's the files page. If I wish to upload files, I can. Uh, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to go on. This custom fields, this is a list of custom fields that have been configured for my account. These are outside of infers. They will not be sent to infers. This is my own questions. And I put in these questions, I put in these answers. And so we go through here, we put in all these different things. These are just examples. I'm just making these up. OK, so there we go. Now I'm going to hit Save. Custom page turns green because all the required fields have been completed. Hit next. Here's my payroll. Now payroll is volunteer oriented for volunteer points and volunteer pay per call. If you're a full-time department, you can disable the payroll area and not even see the page. So just keep that in mind. And these are all configured for, for this training department. So I'm going to say one hour or one point or whatever I want to do. Now I hit next. Now I get to the authorized page. Before, it wouldn't even let me get there because I had errors. So I put in my password. And because I am a supervisor, I have the, the right to set it to complete and reviewed, which I'm not going to do. So I put in my password. I hit complete. I go back to the open page. Now I have a complete call, which is now yellow. Now, as a reviewer, say I'm the fire chief, I come in here, I look at the calls. I click on the call. I look at it. A quick and easy way is to actually hit the print page. Hit print. Now I can look at all the information at one shot. This is the print page. I can see all the information is put in. OK, it looks like it's been put in appropriately. I'm happy with it as a reviewer. Come in the authorized page. I put in my password. And I hit review. Alternatively, I can kick it back to whoever completed it. But in this case, I'm happy with it. I go back to the incident page. Now it says green. It says reviewed. Okay? So that's key. Now reviewed is key. So what that means is we've met all the infers requirements and or the state infers requirements. Some states have specific changes above and beyond infers, and we handle all of those as well. That's been cleared. And also, the fire chief or reviewer or battalion chief or whoever has reviewed the call and they validated, yes, it's, it's within our, our scope of practice and the documentation is what we expect. I've reviewed it. I've signed off on it. So that's kind of that's key to making this whole thing work. You've got to get to the reviewed status. Because once it's at the review level, it means it's past infers, it's past the state, it's past the fire chief. We're good to go. All right? So um, I'll answer questions in a few minutes, but really getting back to the green padlock is the, the key thing we've got to get to. So once that's done, it turns to green. I click on it. Uh, I try, try to go into a call. It says no. It's been locked and cannot be changed. I have to unlock it. I have to unreview it in order for anyone to get in there. So that's convenient, too. So we know the record has been locked. Also, I have a... A link here says history details. This is a, a log of everyone who touched it. And so we can see if anyone's in there when they shouldn't be or, or they tried to view it or any of that kind of stuff, there's a log behind all these different things. So at this point, the call is complete. It's been reviewed. We're all happy with it. So now we go back to administration. In administration on the left-hand side, there is a series of exports that are visible there. <clears throat> Depends on your account.
For inferrs, it'll be titled inferrs 5.1 export. There's also, in this case, on this particular account, there's a couple others. There's uh, WEMSYS, which is a Washington State flavor of NIMSYS. Um, we're not going to talk about that today, but it's just another export coming out of that review call. There's also NEMSYS, which is, in this case, used for medical billing. If you have medical billing set up, it would also pull data out of the incident and spit it out to your medical billing vendor. Again, dependent upon getting the call to a reviewed status. Everything goes back to having a call to review. Once it's there, it can go split multiple times, multiple ways going out. So to get back on track, we're going to talk about inferrs export. So you have the option here on this account, if you have multiple FBIDs right there, you can choose to do the inferrs export just for one uh, FBID. So I'm going to hit update. And here it gives me a rundown of all the months I can export from my account for this particular FDID. Now, notice on the left-hand side, most of these radio buttons are dimmed out. See that? There's only a handful that are available. Now, what that means is that the system says, like, use March 2015 as an example, right here. Right? Oops, I didn't know. Um, so, March 2015. So, what that's saying is, you have zero calls exported, zero calls need to be exported, and four calls are not yet reviewed. So the system is enforcing you, or it's instructing you, but it's enforcing the practice that you need to complete and review all your calls before you can export. Okay? Once you have all your calls complete and reviewed for the month, which in most cases is sufficient, you'll get the radio button that lights up right here. And it says, now you're ready to go. In this case, it's all zeros, but you'll see it. That's what will happen. Now, some states want to do it by quarter. Some states want to do it by month. Okay? And our system administers that for you. We know which state wants it which way. So I believe in the state of, uh, look at my list here, state of North Carolina, state of California, they want it done by quarter. So instead of seeing months laid out here, you'll see it laid out in uh, quarters, all right? The system does that automatically for you. And so what you do is you just put in your appropriate month. Let's see if I can find one here. December 2013, that's going way in the past, but that's, that's uh, a month I'm prepared to export. In this account, I've configured to do that. I hit export. The system generates a file. It gives you a list of the calls that were generated, and then it, it sends uh, an email on this account that goes to an email account. And this is going to J. And so that's what it'll do. Now, this page will tell you different things depending on your state. What we found is that some states want to upload data to FEMA directly. Some states want the data emailed directly to the state fire marshal so they can administer it. It depends on every state. It's literally you have this big sheet of 50 states, and every single state is handled differently. And that's all configured in your account already. So we'll just follow the instructions that are visible on the page, and it'll tell you, oh, in this case, go to FEMA, upload, follow this one, two, three step-by-step -step instructions to upload the data to FEMA, or we've already sent it to your state fire marshal. That's outlined here as well. It's all set up to happen appropriate to your state and just follow the instructions. If you have any questions, follow up with support, they can get you taken care of. Um, okay, so these messages here will be variable on this page. What do you do uh, if an error is discovered? So what sometimes will happen, uh, the data of our system is quite, quite accurate. It's usually about four or five nines correct. We actually monitor that. So 99.9 .9 or 99.8% of the time, 99.99 or 99.98% of the time, your data is correct with inferrs. If it comes back, we actually view that as a bug, okay, in our system. We view that as our system was expected to perform at 100%. It didn't. There was some tiny, tiny little change. And so we want to fix that problem and make it better. So what we'll do is we'll change the system. Uh, we will follow up with you. Some cases, we can, we, there's no need to follow up with the customer. We can just repair the data and resubmit on your behalf. Depends on the state, depends on the circumstance. One way or another, we try to sort those things out. And so 
um, that data will be correct moving forward. And so we we move uh, several hundred thousand incidents per month. Um, I think we're right now around a third of a million uh, a month. And so we move a lot of data, and we just monitor that continuously. To, the, the, if the data comes back, we want to straighten that out and deal with it. And so that is a very quick rundown of how we input the data and how you export the data. Uh, while we're here, I'm just going to show one more thing. If you have a WEMSYS export or a medical billing export or a state export, um, if I just go through here, hold on, let me try a different one. I'm trying to do a state export, and it says you can't because these two apparatus have not been, been uh, ever well configured. So I'm going to go clear those errors right now. Oh, wow, look at that. Some information is not put in. I'm going to say, fill out a couple of these. The Nemesis vehicle type. Oh, we'll say this is a, let's say this is a, I don't know, medic unit. Ambulance. Save. Oop, look at that. Found a couple of missing fields. I like. Now I try to run my export again. Now this is a medical bill or it's a state EMS export. There we go. Now it will permit me to do it. Same exact sort of logic we saw before. You must get your calls completed and reviewed before we'll allow, allow you to export. So those of you that have or are interested in, in NEMSIS reporting or NEMSIS product, uh, that's how that would be handled. If you have medical billing, you have a similar page. You can do medical billing export. It's all driven out of the same thing. That's a little bit off uh, outside the scope we'll talk about today, but that's how you do it. And uh, all predicated on having a review call uh, in there. Okay, so at this point, that's all the objectives I want to accomplish with the training. We're just over halfway through uh, the one hour we had set aside. I'd like to open it up for, for questions, and we'll try to answer whatever questions you may have on how to do infers exporting, infers incidents, or anything uh, along those lines. So go ahead and please type out a question uh, on the session, and we'll uh, answer them as best we can. So any, any questions, please feel free to comment. You know, uh, in the meantime, I'm going to just touch on a few more things uh, in the incident module I think is relevant. Ah, perfect question. Wonderful. It says, where do I change the email address of the person for the infers report? Perfect question. So uh, back, let's see if I can get back there. When I go to infers, says, OK, I, I do my export. It says down here at the very bottom, perfect question. Thank you for bringing that question up. Perfect. Down here at the very bottom, it says, export rece receipts will be sent for this export type will be sent to this email address, jdemoosereporter.com. How do I change that? Perfect. So at this point in time, those can only be changed by support. And so all you need to do is just email support and just identify your agency, who you're with, and then you want to change these email addresses. Now, that can be more than one. You could have five email addresses on there. You could have one for your state, one for your chief, one for your data, you know, your system chief, and two for your reviewers. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can have just one person. It goes to your fire chief, and that's the end of it, or, or just to the state. Uh, we generally, if in the cases where the state will accept email data, we generally try to have the, the fire chief or a fire department representative and also the state. So that way, there's a, a double check. So if the state comes back and says, you never sent me my data, um, the fire chief can look at their emails and say, oh, no, here it is. Also, by in the event that ever happens, you could always re-export any of this data after the fact. Um, so in the event you export your data every month, and then a year later, the state says, hey, we never got March of last year, um, you could just re-export it. And if you can't figure out how to do that, uh, it's, it's here in the export history, but if you can't figure out how to do that, just email support, we'll help you do that. So you, you can always re-export your data after the fact. Um, okay, next question is, uh, how do you, and thank you, uh, Alan Porter, for that question about Infer's report uh, for changing the email address. That's a good one. Next one, how do you create custom questions? Another good one. I will show you that right now. So in administration, there's a two-step process to do that. On the left-hand side, you will have uh, required fields right there. 
this is a little funky, okay? Um, it, so it says required fields. And so these are required fields that are outside of the infers and or nemesis requirements that the system comes pre-configured with. So I click required fields. And here are some questions you can elect to make required above and beyond the infers or nemesis requirements. And at the very bottom of this, there is a, a one that here it says include custom fields. So that is saying make the custom fields page required. So that in this case has already been clicked as enabled. So first step, I gotta uh, make that required, which I've done. And I hit save. And then I go administration. And it says required correction, user defined fields. Second from the bottom, user defined fields. I click that. And it is, whoa, look at all these custom fields that have been set up. There's a bunch. Some of these are turned on, some of them are turned off. And so uh, the ones that have been turned off have this green little little arrow, which means they can be brought back from the dead. They can be undeleted to be brought back. So these are questions that have been collected in the past. <clears throat> I'm going to click on edit on one that's already in place. And so here are some questions. If this was a cooking fire, was the occupant present? Perfect. Perfect question. Sequence, zero. What does that mean? Well, you may want to sequence your questions. So you might have a cooking fire might be first. And you might have a question about something else about a cooking fire or something else about was a Red Cross notified, you'd want sequence two or one after that. So that's how you can you can change the sequence of the questions that are asked. That's what sequence is. Required, it's checkbox, make this field as required, meaning the user must complete this question and they must complete the page before they can review the call overall, or complete the call overall. So you can you can make this field required all the time. And now you have a couple different options. You can make a single selection. You can make a type in. So a single selection would be like a drop down. Uh, a type in would be a, a narrative text field they can type in themselves. And then they can add a new answer. So you can have all your own controls right here and answer your own questions and spell it out, whatever you want to ask, and hit save. Now, one, one of the things I want to highlight is that at this point in time today, there is no way to, to specify logical conditions. So you cannot say, only ask this, ask this question if it's a 100 series fire. That does not exist today. Okay, so just keep that in mind. That is a known limitation with the custom questions. Okay, um, so that's about that. Next question, who is the appropriate contact at ERS if you receive an in-first error report? Does that go through a routine support ticket? Okay, so let me answer that two ways. One, all the bounce backs that come back from the state we will generally receive, and they go into a queue, and we will generally watch them and make the correction and get back to you. However, if you are ever pinched for time, you need to get through something quickly. The state is after you and infra is reporting, and there's a some of your calls are bouncing, and you're not clear why, and it needs to be done right now. Just start a support ticket, and we'll get you a square away immediately. If there is a lot of states just don't care enough to hunt down a single call that is bounced out of all the calls that have come in out of your, your incident. So if that's the case, they will get generally uh, straightened out, you know, over a couple weeks or a month long cycle. Uh, but if it's a priority, the start support ticket will get you taken care of. Um, okay, so while I'm waiting for more questions, I'm going to go to the incident module and I want to just really quick point out on one other thing, a couple other things. In the course of reviewing the calls, you can go through one at a time. Look at call number one, look at the print page, it's okay, review it, move on to the next two. Go into call number two, review it, so on and so forth. That can get awfully tedious. So what you can do is you can, on the left hand side here, you can search on, in the, the multi-record search, you can review on complete calls only, okay? Complete calls only. And so when you do that, of course I have none. Hold on, let me set one up. I'm going to downgrade a reviewed call to the complete level so you can see what I'm talking about. Change it to complete calls only. I get, here's a call, it's complete. Now, on the left hand side, this is one of those things worth pointing out. There's a little checkbox right there. See that? So what you can do, is you may care 
only about maybe you only want to review fires, and you're like, eh, you know, as, as in this hypothetical example, I'm not going to review EMS calls because we have a an EMS, uh, you know, an ambulance local EMS rescue squad or a third party EMS service, and they do EMS, and we show up to do to help them, but it's really not part of our core thing. So I'm not going to worry about reviewing EMS calls. So I can actually, you know, let me see if I can set this up a little better. Just a moment, I'm going to set this up. And I guess that's, that's not going to quite work, that's not going to do what I want. Okay, well, just imagine we had 10, 10 calls listed out here. I could go through and hit the checkbox, check, 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 and I could bulk review eight of my 10 calls in all in mass at one time by going up here and putting in my password at the right top. And review eight of those calls at one time because it's just it's just not a part of my core thing. I'm just not going to worry about it. And then I can zero in on those two calls. Maybe it's a car accident. Maybe it's a fire. Then I want to look at a little more detail. So just keep that in mind. You can use this to to bulk review a bunch of calls to quickly get through more calls to reviewed status. There's absolutely nothing wrong with reviewing each individual call by itself one at a time. You can easily do that. However, if you want a bulk review, um, you can do it there. Um, also, while I'm waiting. If there's any more questions, uh, okay, I don't see more questions that popped up. I'm going to show you another powerful tool here. Um, I can, oh, we have a very powerful advanced search page. This is on the left-hand side up here, advanced search right there. There's also a single record, uh, which is the next tab that's a middle tab. That's just for jumping to an individual incident. So you want to dive into a call way back in the past. 2013-123, you can do it here and then just jump right to the call. I'm not going to click on it because it's, it's pretty straightforward. And so um, right now I'm going to go click Advanced Search. So what Advanced Search will do is you can string, uh, you can string together multiple search criteria at one time. So I want to see, for example, all the calls that took place at the Broadway station for all time. Hit Search. Okay, here we go. Here's all the calls for all time in my account, including imported data if necessary. Uh, they're at, out of that station. Now, maybe I want to also, I want to see all my incident types, all my fires, 100 series fires. One hundred through one seventy three for the Broadway station only. Okay, look at all that. Now let's go a little deeper. I want to change my date range. I want to see only data for uh, January 1st, 2013 through 1231 of 2014, a two year period for a station one, fires only. Okay, so you continue to tighten this up. You can just keep going. You want to see all this, and I want to see calls that, I'm just going to pick on Dave Adams. Dave Adams attended station one for two year period for any fires. Two calls. These, for whatever reason I'm trying to do, these are the two fires that Dave Adams attended for a two year period at station one. Just, you can just do whatever you want to, to get to that detailed search. Okay, now one more thing. While I'm here, I'm going to answer your question in just a moment. Um, if I have mapping enabled, I can actually click up here in conjunction with the search page or without the search page. In fact, I'm going to clear off all my search criteria for that exact reason. Turn all these off. Go back to multi record, all calls for all time. I can go up here. And there's a switch to map view. And so if you have a mapping product, you can click this. And this is Google Maps streamed in right in on your system, right? And these are your calls displayed in the system, right to the web browser, securely right over the web. And so here I can zoom in and I can see my different heat maps. These are green heat maps. So I can see the calls where there's more call density. 
So you zoom in, zoom out, you'll see more calls. Here in the Whatcom County area, Bellingham, Washington, which is where we, we're at. So you can, all your calls will map automatically. So here's the Canadian border right here, and here's uh, Vancouver, BC, it's just to the north. And here's our calls, okay? So we can turn maps on. I don't, uh, there's a whole different training to do, but I like maps. So, and there's a backdoor grid view of our regular calls. Okay, so uh, I had a question here. Can you take the bulk review off and make it mandatory to go through each call? Good question. Uh, no, you cannot. At this point, it's required that you you can, excuse me, back up a step. At this point, you can either review the calls one at a time, or you can bulk review calls. There's no way to force your reviewers to use one method or another. You, those are the two options. However, for what it's worth, almost nobody knows about that bulk review trick. So that's why I like to publicize it, because otherwise nobody seems to know about it. So um, that's just an option. Um, OK, uh, good. Any other questions? <clears throat> Let's see what else I could, uh, I could talk about. Um, you know, we didn't talk much about logical errors, but that's something I'd, uh, I'd like to touch on just really quick. So sometimes in infers, you can get into these odd states where if you complete changes to a structure fire, if you complete a fire, let's change, let's change this. If you complete, if you complete one type of field, another case must be true or false. And so, you get this in situations where you get like a fire. Let's see if I can do it here. Uh, I'm in the fire heat source uh, area of fire origin. Um, let's see if I can do this. Heat source. It's the item confined to the item, or fire is confined to the item first ignited. It's, I'm not. I'm sorry. I may, I may not be able to quite set this up. Just a moment. Uh, you'll get these weird cases. There it is. There it is. Uh, no flame spread or unable determined, and then fire spread beyond a building of origin. You, yeah, you can't do it. See that? So you, in this case, the user says, no flame spread. But then up here, I said, beyond the fire spread beyond the building of origin. So those two are, you cannot get those. Those should not be in sync. You should not be able to have both those true. The system will actually, should actually catch that and give you an error. Uh, well, it's bare. I'm sorry. It's buried in here. That was a very good example. But you know, Yenfers has a bunch of these logical rules where these two cases are, are uh, in conflict. You can't do these two things. You cannot have it set to no flame spread and also set at the same time, use it extended beyond the building of origin. We'll catch those uh, if at all possible. So that was one of the, I made a mention earlier that we're going to catch logical errors. That's what I mean. We'll talk about that and we'll catch those. If at this point the system is so mature, we've been doing this over 12 years, um, most of those have been flushed out. If a bug comes in, it's usually it's one of these really, really finite cases that's got three, three and statements and it's very specific. That's where we're down to finding those kind of bugs. Um, we'll try to catch them and resolve them if at all possible. Um, those are logical errors. We also try to catch those. I made mention of it earlier, but didn't actually call it out. So that's how, that's how that works. Um, okay. Any other questions? Um, all right, so I'd find something else we can talk about. Uh, you know, one thing that's uh, kind of glossed over, you don't really see it unless you click on the exposures page. The way infers is structured, it's designed to run a primary incident and then up to 999 exposures. And you say, well, what is an exposure? Well, the primary incident is the exposure number zero. And I know that doesn't make any sense, but it's computer speak for the primary incident is exposure zero, primary exposure, primary incident zero. So when you get into the incident, that's what you see. Uh, you're in the primary incident. You don't even know it. However, if you have 
multiple exposures. Um, this is where you'd add multiple exposures. And so on the exposure page, you'd click Add New Exposure. I'm sorry, let me back up and describe, describe this. You get an exposure up here. You click the Exposure button. You click Add New Exposure. And you say, well, what the heck is an exposure in this, in this sense? Well, if you think in a typical fire sense, right, you might have a building fire. And then what do you have? Uh, maybe to, you know, it's a, a built-up area. And to your left, you've got a building, uh, a neighbor's building caught on fire. To the right, you have a different neighbor's building. Maybe uh, the, the siding is melted. You're able to stop the fire before it extended to the neighboring building. And then you've got a car out front that caught on fire, and the paint was scorched off in the car. So in that example, you got you could have one primary exposure, one primary incident, and three exposures. Neighbor's house to the left on the uh, B boys Bravo side of the building. You could have a fire to the right on the D Delta side of the building. And you could have a, a a car fire. You know maybe the paint was baked off on the A Alpha side of the building. So how do you describe those? Here's that's where you hit Add New Exposure, and these are little incidents that are, are different. And in this case, the system knows you're in a, a, uh, a exposure, and it will treat it differently and collect more information. Okay, So you can, might even change the way the type of the fire is. Maybe your exposure building, maybe you just baked off the side, right? baked off the siding. Um, so you might have a different 100 series fire. You might have, uh, who knows what, I'm just looking around now. Special outside fire, other. Maybe that's one we're going to do, and it changes the number of fields. So, anyways, that's how you can have it. So you can have an exposure on the left-hand fire, an exposure on the right-hand fire, an exposure uh, on the cars parked out front, and everyone can be different. You have different property owners in each case. You could even have different uh, ignition sources, right? You have radiant energy on the left and on the, the B side of the structure and the A side of the structure, and you have maybe an ember on the C side of the structure land on the roof. You can use the exposures to track those independently if you want to do that. That's how you do it, through exposures. The whole system knows how to deal with that. You know, logic and errors and required fields and export to FEMA. It's all wired in. You just take exposures. That's how you handle it. Um, OK. Uh, anything else? We're winding down now. It's almost uh, uh, We have seven minutes to go to the end of the training. OK. You know, there's uh, just one more thing I thought would be relevant we could talk about real quick. This is more aimed at as system administrators or reviewers. On the main page, the welcome page, when you first come into the system, uh, on the uh, right hand side of the page, where it says here, change, oops, anyway, where it says here, change my notifications, yeah. you can change uh, when you see different calls. And so, oh, sorry, I'm having difficulties here. Okay, change my notifications. And under incidents, there's a couple options, and it's here, here, right here. It says display number of incomplete incidents assigned to me. That would be maybe a good appropriate for a submitter who needs to complete their calls. Number, and the next one is display number of incidents that need to be reviewed. So that would be maybe if I'm a, a system administrator, I can see that as a reminder. A bunch of calls need to be reviewed. And the next one is display the number of incomplete patients assigned to me. So these can be tailored to, to get some notification on the main incident page, correction, the main welcome page, so you can see what that looks like. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say all three. Why not? Do all that and hit save. Now my, I have a new notification page right here. It says incidents. You have one incomplete incident assigned to you. You have one incident waiting to be reviewed, and I have zero incomplete patients assigned to you. So now, in the course of coming into my system and going about my business and doing whatever I'm doing, every time I hit this page, the system will tell me if there's something outstanding waiting for me. This change of notifications page is very powerful. There is a ton of stuff you can configure. So it's appropriate to your job description, right? If you're a maintenance officer, you have maintenance stuff up here. If you're a training officer, you can have your training. If you're a fire inspector, you can have all your fire inspections. And if you're maybe a fire inspector supervisor, you can have it configured so you can keep track of if everyone's doing their inspection like they're supposed to, if everyone's reviewing their calls like they're supposed to. It's all wired in to help manage that, all different things or whatever your role is in your department or agency. Mm -hmm. OK. So any more questions? Um, you know, we're done for three minutes. Um, I think I'm just going to comment on two other things that think it's relevant. Uh, I have a little bit of time. 
up in the upper right-hand corner throughout the entire system, there's a couple hyperlinks. There's uh, three of them up here on the right-hand side. There is support, help, and log out. Uh, log out, of course, clears your session and dumps you out to the main page. It's pretty simple. Um, there's also the support page. And clicking support gives you a, a quick rundown of the options available if you need help. And, of course, my support page now decides to take a couple seconds to load. Wow. Slow page load. Okay, there we go. Um, this redirects over to our help desk uh, on Zendesk. And it talks about we have a knowledge base on the right-hand side. These are all a bunch of very quick, easy-to-use pieces of information. Sometimes there's videos. Sometimes there's just text. It walks you quick, quickly about what you need to know. So, like, for example, I click on administration. It goes, how do I add a new user? I go, click here, adding a new user. Here are step-by-step -step instructions. So screenshots, here's all you need to do. Very simple, very easy to use. Walks you through how to do it. Um, just a lot of wonderful resources here. How do I add an apparatus? Right, we clicked on that earlier. Yeah, here we go, step-by-step. -step. Click here, click here, click here. All the information, uh, one, one, two, three, all the way through. Very, very useful stuff here. Uh, it just takes seconds to look at, gives you the information you need. It's quite good. Um, also, there is help. This is this will drive directly into individual page help. It's like the support link, but better. Not said better, but sometimes it's more detailed. So I'll dive in exactly how this page functions. Also good to look at. So that information's right there. Also right there. Um, the last thing I want to show is back in support, there is suggest a feature. This is the one I'm going to leave you with right now. And I love this. I love this because it's so useful to get this. People always want to know, how do I make suggest a change to the system? How, I have this problem. I want to make this feature. I want to make this change. How do I do that? This is how you do that. This is the answer to that question. So this, you go click suggest a feature. And this is a user voice. And what this is, is this is one of the main mechanisms we solicit feedback from our users on how to change the system. This is the real deal, OK? We watch this. This is how we, we participate and we want our users to participate. And you, you get a different, couple different options on how to do it. Here you have the name, um, you have votes. And I'll pull these apart. I'll show you how to do these. And you have votes. So uh, it goes down from the top, 891 votes. This one is 589 votes. This one is 552 votes going on down. And I tell you, the, the key, these are called user stories. And the key to writing a good user story is to be specific enough to accomplish something of value, but not so broad that it's huge. For example, we have some reports, actually not that many of these, but give you an example of what a good user, a bad user story would be is. Make the hydrant module better. Well, that's not easy to pull apart. How do you, if you were to, to, to write a series of stories to, to make the, the, the hydrant module better, well, how do we know if we did the right thing or not? It doesn't really help. But however, maybe a user story would be, I'll have an offline hydrant app so I could do flow tests and hydrant activities in the field without internet connectivity. OK, that's a lot more manageable. That's something you can get your teeth around and that's our arms around. And we, can, we can quantify that as something we could accomplish or not. And when people vote on that, they're, it's much more clear what they're voting on. That's something that's actionable, it's doable. Now, it doesn't have to be something big. It could be something very simple. It could be something like, well, for example, we, our question a few minutes ago, where right, we just had uh, from Landon Ball, who said, can I turn the bulk review off and make it mandatory to go individual incident or reviews of the calls? Perfect. See how specific that is? You can write that. So here is an example. It says here, as a blank, I want blank, so that. So for example, in that perfect example of bulk review, you'd say, as a system administrator or department administrator or as a department fire chief, I want to configure the options available for reviewing the calls so that my users review the calls one by one and verify that it's correct instead of glossing over and doing the bulk review. All right. 
See how straightforward that is? It's everyone understands what that is. And now they can they know if, if they see value in that, they can vote on it. All right? So let's use this number one as an example. 891 votes. As an assistant chief, and we're over time, folks, so I'm sorry, if you need to split, go right ahead. I'm just going to talk about this for another minute or two. As an assistant chief, I would like to see an option to complete the daily and weekly apparatus checks in the system. Okay, we got that. 891 votes, number one in the system. All right, pretty important. So we've been watching this. It came in February 22nd of 2014. It's now risen to the top. And we have here, it's currently five is under review by the product owner team. It's myself and a couple other people. And we watch, marketing watches this. We watch this and we talk about ways we can accomplish this story in here. And so we put in here, this is one of the things. There's been other stories that have been flushed out and have dropped off the list. But this one is currently number one. So we, here's our comment. We put here June 30th, just um, over a month ago. Uh, other projects have been pushed back. We're still planning on this. Uh, our hope is we get started with new changes to the maintenance module. We literally talked about this yesterday in a big corporate meeting we had about this. And here's other comments about uh, we could definitely use this. It would be helpful if you could do it with flight appropriate people could have a problem found in the apparatus check. Other comments about uh, how it would be useful, plus some other comments is just like absolutely we need to have this. Okay, I get that. Um, just other discussion. Clearly, look at all this. Look at all these comments. Clearly all the interest, number one position, 891 votes. This helps, folks. This really helps. So um, you have votes in here. You can log in and uh, vote on your own things. You can suggest new features. And we use this as, as a major component and consideration of our business objectives of developing new products. So uh, and maintaining the existing products, not just building new products. So please keep that in mind. And there's a great way to solicit feedback or to, to deliver feedback. Uh, and we really appreciate it, uh, all the, the, the work people put in on this. Okay, so with that, I'm going to sign off. Thank you, everyone, for, for your uh, your time, or one hour and four minutes into this. Um, if you have any other follow-up questions, you can reach out to support. You can also uh, talk to training. Uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong page. There we go. Um, and of course, now going back. There we go. I talk to you, training at emergencyplanning.com. If you have additional details and want to learn more about uh, online sessions, virtual Thursdays, um, online training from delivery department, or on site training, uh, you can reach out to Nicole at training at emergencyplanning.com or give us a call at the numbers below uh, and we can answer whatever questions you may have. In the meantime, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, have a good, safe shift. <laughs>